Welcome to the Unitarian Church of Lincoln on this Sunday morning. My name is the Reverend Oscar Sinclair. It is so good to be together and to be with you. We're joined in this video by members of the staff of the Unitarian Church of Lincoln. Our member and admin coordinator, coordinator Kelly Ross, is handling the technology and hosting the call this morning. Our administrative and music directors, Gene Helms and Bob Fusen, are here. And it is a pleasure to once again introduce our guest preacher this morning, the Reverend Kimberly Debus, our affiliated community minister. It is good to see you all this morning. We also have lay pastoral care folks on call this morning. So if for whatever reason you need somebody to talk to or you need somebody to process with, it has been a hard week in the world. So please, please reach out. You can email pastoralcare at unitarianlincoln.org. You can email me and we will get you in contact with somebody to talk to. We're still practicing this new way of being together, of being online and figuring out how to do worship like this. This is a time of anxiety in the world, but it's also a time of great possibility. We're learning a lot very quickly about how to be a church together and apart. Lots has changed over the last three months, but what has not changed is the vision of this church that the Unitarian Church of Lincoln is a loving community, uniting reason with spiritual exploration to transform ourselves and transform the world. That is true every single time we gather together, whether that's on YouTube on Sunday morning, at Vespers on Thursday night in front of the Capitol, at a protest on Saturday morning. That is always true. That is always who we are. And we know that that vision begins every time we gather with welcome. So whether this is your first time here or your 500th, whether you have stumbled onto this video on YouTube or if you are a longtime member getting by doing this until we're back together in our building, if you come here hopeful or heartbroken, whatever your age, gender, skin color, whomever you love, you are welcome here with us. More than ever, it is important that we share the light and warmth and truth of this place out in the world. So our ask is simple to everyone. Do not keep this church, this community, a hidden gem. And this week, I'll go further than that. Do not keep the, the principles of this faith hidden in your life. This is a moment that calls for, for faith to be out loud, to be out in the public square, to be saying, this is who we are, this is what we believe, this is what we're about, come be a part of this. So be a part of it and invite people in. If you know folks who are struggling with the world right now, ask them to come join us. If you know folks who are struggling to make meaning of the world in this moment when so much seems to be breaking down, invite them in. If you know folks who are proclaiming Black Lives Matter and who are looking for a spiritual home that will affirm the same thing, invite them here. We have work to do, but we do that work together. As we enter into worship, take a moment to center yourself wherever you are. Find a comfortable place within your body. Take a couple deep breaths and let us begin. As we prepare to light our chalice, I offer these words from Manish Mijra Marzetti. Between rocking the boat and sitting down, between stirring things up and peaceably going along, we find ourselves here in community, each called from many different journeys, many different life paths on this river road. Some are here because the rocking of the boat has been too much, too much tumult, too much uncertainty, too much pain. Some are here with questions about where the boat is going, how best to steer it, where this journey ends. Others are here as lovers of the journey, lovers of life itself. Here, in front, beside, behind, each a passenger, each a captain, 
doing the best we can. Rest here in your boat with me, the river calls. Listen to how I flow, the sound of life coursing all around you. Let the current hold you, let the current guide you. The river that gently flows through your soul whispers, come, let us worship together. reading today is an excerpt from Unitarian Christianity by William Ellery Channing. We believe in the doctrine of God's unity, or that there is one God and one only. To this truth, we give infinite importance, and we feel ourselves bound to take heed, lest any man spoil us of it by vain philosophy. 
the proposition that there is one God seems to us exceedingly plain. We understand by it that there is one being, one mind, one person, one intelligent agent, and one only to whom underived and infinite perfection and dominion belong. We conceive that these words could have conveyed no other meaning to the simple and uncultivated people who were set apart to be the depositaries of this great truth and who were utterly incapable of understanding those hairbreadth distinctions between being and person, which the sagacity of later ages has discovered. We find no intimation that this language was to be taken in an unusual sense or that God's unity was a quite different thing from the oneness of other intelligent beings. We object to the doctrine of the Trinity that whilst acknowledging in words, it subverts in effect the unity of God. According to this doctrine, there are three infinite and equal persons possessing supreme divinity called the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Each of these persons, as described by theologians, has his own particular consciousness, will, and perceptions. They love each other, converse with each other, and delight in each other's society. They perform different parts in man's redemption, each having his appropriate office, and neither doing the work of the other. When we attempt to conceive of three gods, we can do nothing more than represent to ourselves three agents, distinguished from each other by similar marks and peculiarities to those which separate the persons of the Trinity. And when common Christians hear these persons spoken of as conversing with each other, loving each other, and performing different acts, how can they help regarding them as different beings, different minds? We do then, with all earnestness, though without reproaching our brethren, protest against the irrational and unscriptural doctrine of the Trinity, to us, as to the apostle and the primitive Christians, there is one God, even the Father. With Jesus, we worship the Father as the only living and true God. We are astonished that any man can read the New Testament and avoid the conviction that the Father alone is God. Of that could not be clearer, even if he does spend over 14,000 words clarifying it. This assertion that puts down a marker in the annals of history. From this point forward, on this day in 1819, in this church in the city of Baltimore, on the occasion of the ordination of Jordan Sparks, let it be known that once and for all we will be Unitarian and be known by that name. It's a hell of a thing to assert this and know you're not going to be excommunicated or imprisoned or exiled or burned at the stake <clears throat> because for centuries that's what you could get for espousing heresy which is what this was maybe I should start at the beginning in this case the beginning is the early 300s now the Jesus movement has gotten legs and spread throughout the Mediterranean thanks in part to the Roman Emperor Constantine who converted his empire which is a story for another day, but suffice it to say that this empire-wide conversion meant that the various theologies and writings and teachings that had spread over the previous centuries needed to be codified and organized if the church was going to be a help and not a hindrance to the growth of the empire. So this was, by and large, going okay, but there was a bit of brouhaha over the ontology or the nature of being of God and Jesus and spirit. And this kerfuffle being led on one side by Athanasius from Alexandria and on the other by Arius, a Libyan priest also serving in Alexandria, became so divisive that a big council was held in Nicaea, which is just south of what is now Istanbul. Now, a lot of business was actually accomplished at this council, which was held in 325. <clears throat> the writings were curated and put into a canon we now call the New Testament. They codified how to calculate the date of Easter, which was a big deal. And they constructed the first part of the creed that, with some linguistic changes, is still repeated every Sunday in most mainline Christian churches. 
It is very clear about what the nature of God is, that the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost pr proceed from the Father, and that all three together are to be worshipped and glorified. And with the passage of that, and after a lot of arguments and at least one fist fight, the doctrine of the Trinity was established, and Arius and his supporters became heretics. Because what good is the establishment of a doctrine if you don't punish the people for not following it? And punish they did. It seems that nearly every generation has had its heretics, people within the church who held a belief or theory that strongly contradicted the established doctrines. Some, like Galileo Galilei, were punished for promoting scientific theories. Some, like Joan of Arc, dared to push gender boundaries. Some, like Martin Luther, got in trouble for calling out the abuses of the church he served and pointing out where they went astray. <laughs> Silly Martin. But over and over, some scholar would actually read the text of the Bible and realize that the Trinity was not biblical, and they'd speak up, and then they'd be tried for heresy, and then they'd be punished. In the mid-1500s, Spanish scholar Michael Servetus was so adamant about this that even after John Calvin warned him to stay away, or he'd be tried and burned at the stake, Servetus did what any good heretic would do. He came to Geneva anyway to argue with Calvin against the Trinity, and, well, he was tried and burned at the stake. In the mid-1600s, English scholar John Biddle again asserted the errors of the Trinity and was tried and should have been put to death, except he was friends with Oliver Cromwell, who in that moment was still in charge. And so Cromwell instead had Biddle exiled to the Isles of Scilly near Cornwall. There were others, too, throughout Europe who wrote volumes on this one issue. How could the same people who espoused the first commandment, I am the Lord thy God, and you shall have no others before me, how could they espouse that and think this three-God thing was okay? And each time, these scholars added to the conversation. And no, clearly the doctrine hasn't disappeared. In fact, according to the Christian liturgical calendar, today is Trinity Sunday, and every mainline Christian church is singing, Holy, 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 God in three persons, blessed Trinity. Which means it's a great day to talk about this Unitarian heresy. No, the doctrine of the Trinity hasn't disappeared, but thanks to the Age of Enlightenment and a new reliance on the scientific method and the use of reason, we see this question shift from a heresy punishable by death to a question around the individual search for truth and a freedom of religious thought. Which brings us back to Channing who inherited this way of thinking and these questions and by 1819 was sick to death of the insults because by this time the charge of heresy in the congregational churches in the new United States was little more than an insult and in fights over the silver. This is our history. Our history that says if we are going to use reason and affirm the responsible search for truth and if we're actually going to affirm and promote those things that Jesus affirmed and promoted in his ministry, <clears throat> inherent worth, compassion, justice, connection, then we need to not get caught up in doctrinal controversies and fake fights. Now, it may seem odd, this history lesson on a day like today in the midst of a pandemic and a revolution, with all of its heartbreak and hardship, violence and loss, that it matters to know our history, to know that how we understand our Unitarian Universalist faith, how we live it out every day, isn't new. That we are the inheritors of a glorious heretic spirit. So let's pause here for a breath and a time of prayer and meditation. And so this morning we pray for all those who join together on this Sunday. 
for all who grieve, for all who celebrate, for all those in moments of joy, moments of sorrow, moments of rage for righteousness's sake. We pray for all in their homes, for all going to work, for all in the streets protesting, for all trying to make sense of what this all means and how we might respond. In all of those places, all of our places, there the divine is found. Some transcendent unity joining it into one human experience. The psalmist writes, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If, my, if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you, and the night is as bright as the day. The darkness is as light to you. It's the 139th Psalm. Amen. This next song comes from Mark Miller. We've sung other pieces of his in the past. We'll sing them again. We'll use another piece that may be more familiar towards the end of this service. This is a song about hope in times where it's hard to find hope. This is I Believe.
I believe in the sun even when it's not shining. I believe in love even when I don't feel it. I believe in God even when he is silent. These words etched on a wall at Auschwitz and beautifully sung just now by the women of the Basilica of St. Mary Cathedral Choir remind us of what's at our core. To know something is true even when all the evidence around us says it isn't. That's what faith is, you know, the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And it's why heresy doesn't go away and why we claim our rightful place as heretics. Because what we know to be true, as eloquently expressed in our principles, can be as hard to see in the world as the sun when it's not shining. Now, in 2020, there are a lot more important things to worry about than the Unitarian heresy. Scholars really only debate the Trinity now for sport. But being heretics, we know a thing or two about challenging the status quo from within, about not taking things said as gospel truth, about measuring laws and doctrines and principles against our own moral code and our faith, about following love, about knowing that there is always more to learn and experience. As 20th century Unitarian theologian James Luther Adams famously wrote, Revelation is continuous. Nothing is set in stone. And that's a good thing. It means we are open to new ideas and new stories. And it matters that we hear new stories, especially now when we get fed the narratives of what's happening on our streets, narratives that are crafted for a particular outcome. As heretics, we're open to hearing all the stories because it's the only way we can truly build the beloved community. Dr. Glenn Thomas Rideout, the Director of Worship at the UU Congregation of Ann Arbor, suggests there is a connection between the composition of music and how we can build beloved community. He asks us to think about the difference between blend and harmony, one requiring sameness and the other requiring difference. Now music, as you know, is a series of notes played in combination, a chord. When we move from isolated individualism into community, we become musically rich. We sound like a chord. Each note is articulated, but together the sound is a greater whole. When we seek harmony, we are trying to make things fit together perfectly to be pleasing and familiar. And familiar. At, at times we seek unity where the voices are indistinguishable, like water droplets in a pond. But we are also called to keep individual notes distinct while still making music together. We can use this analogy of musical harmony to better understand our world and our call right now. Do we buy into the narrative being fed to us by press secretaries and some in the media? Do we buy into the narrative we've long held personally or as a nation? Are we seeking to blend into sameness? Or are we seeking to create new harmonies and new dissonances that shape the future we wish to see? Let's not forget that the revolution happening on the streets right now is about shifting the narrative that's embedded in our culture. Long held narratives that kept racism, xenophobia, misogyny, homophobia, transphobia, classism, and ableism alive. We must admit that these narratives, which are meant to keep us all in lockstep, just aren't working and haven't been for a long time. It matters, these revolutions of narrative. It's what drives us to bend the moral arc of the universe toward justice. And as heretics, we are inclined to and are called to check in on our own assumptions. What assumptions are you making about the protests, the methods, the message, the participants? All too often, our emotional reactions get in the way of actually hearing and accepting different truths. We dig in our heels and feel some combination of frustration, anxiety, and maybe even shame. But our heretic spirit reminds us to hear others' truths 
and measure them in context with our ethics and our morals and our principles. And those ethics and morals and principles, those very things we espouse in our Unitarian Universalist faith, which is built on centuries of reason and thought and compassion and, yes, heresy, our principles are nothing if they do not propel us into action and occasionally some civil disobedience in the name of what is right and true and compassionate and inclusive. Now let me be clear, not everyone can be in the streets. Others are called to speak or write or support with much needed funds or send supplies or teach or learn or some combination of all of those things. And in this pandemic, there's an added layer of ensuring safety and health for ourselves, our loved ones, and our communities. But everyone can act. Everyone can answer the call of the heretic spirit. I imagine Servetus and Biddle and others would remind us that what matters is the call of Jesus' ministry, a call to compassion, to inclusion, to justice. Our lineage is full of the words and deeds of prophetic people, providing over and over again the examples of good people willing to challenge the status quo, to change the narrative, to do as their spirits say do. And every one of them drawing the circle just a little bit wider. Every one of them calling us to our part of bending the long moral arc. That, maybe, more than the Unitarian Trinitarian thing, is our biggest heresy, to espouse a love that is more inclusive and expansive in the face of those who fear that it will lead the community of believers away from the Orthodox. Our heresy is affirming that no one is outside the circle of love. So let's go, heretics. Let's go draw the circle wide. As we draw our time together this morning to a close, just a few announcements before we go our separate ways. This morning, there will be a meeting of the LGBTQA com welcoming committee of this congregation. Details for that will be in the chat box running alongside this video. Also today at 11, uh, we'll have our religious growth and learning meeting for, uh, for children and their parents. Um, come hear a story, do some activities, and connect with each other. We're drawing to the end of our congregational year now. And next weekend would normally be a very uh, special weekend in the life of the congregation. It's the weekend when we usually do the flower ceremony that was developed years ago uh, in the Czech, Czech Republic. And we've continued on doing that uh, in recent years. That ceremony depends, though, on folks being together and exchanging flowers with each other. And given the reality of the pandemic, that is not a realistic thing to do in the same way this year. So we're going to have a little bit different of a ceremony. You'll remember from years past that a large part of that Sunday is showing a congregational slideshow. One of our members, Harry Hafer, has been hard at work putting together a slideshow of our congregational life together over the last year. We're going to show that on Thursday night at our Thursday night Vespers service on Zoom. So if you're, if you're interested in that, or if you've never seen one of these Thursday night services and want to see what they're about, come out on Thursday night. The link to the, the Zoom meeting will be in your e-blast. Also on Sunday, rather than exchanging flowers, we are going to uh, exchange signs. Gene Helms and some other folks have been hard at work putting together yard signs for the Unitarian Church of Lincoln in recent weeks. When we begin these services online, each, each week I start by saying, don't keep this place a hidden gem. Proclaim your Unitarian Universalist values out loud. So what we're going to do next week is next Sunday after the YouTube service, we're going to have about 150 yard signs put in, to, in the church along A Street. And so we invite you to come one at a time and take one of the signs, take them home with you and put it in your front yard. 
show the city and show the world what this faith and this community are about. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Our closing hymn is another Mark Miller song, Draw the Circle Wide, which I've preached about as, as the center of the universalist heresy. So it is a good way to draw us to a close. Thank you for being here. This is Draw the Circle Wide. stands alone we'll stand side by side draw the circle draw the circle wide draw the circle wide draw it wider still let this be our song no one stands Draw the
As we extinguish our chalice, I offer these closing words from Edwin Markham. He drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. Go in love, go in joy, go in peace.